Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, June 27th, 2018 edition of the Science and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We got a little postscript from Didier today about the XPS file that Lorna analyzed in last week's diary. Didier goes over how to use his sipdump.py utility in order to gain more insight more quickly into this file type. The reason this works is that XPS files, just like so many documents, are zip containers and well once you unzip them then you can look at the components look at their file types and gain more insight into what's going on with this document and the Wi-Fi Alliance today published the final WPA3 standard. This standard will start to become in effect next year, which means that any new devices that would like to have the Wi-Fi Alliance's logo will have to support WPA3, just like now they have to support WPA2. Now for the foreseeable future, of course, WPA2 will remain to be supported. So you don't have to throw out all of your equipment at once, but starting next year, any new equipment that you purchase, hopefully will have WPA3 support built in. At this point, it's not clear if a software update can be offered to update devices to WPA3, but I would expect for some of the more beefy, more powerful access points and such to be able to be software upgradable. Among all the improvements, there are really sort of two things that stick out when it comes to WPA3. First of all, they're trying to make it more difficult to launch password brute force attacks because weak passwords will probably remain to be a problem. So there are more lockout algorithms in place. Also the key exchange got modified so it's more difficult or impossible to actually brute force passwords offline. Another interesting improvement is the use of opportunistic encryption. What this really means is where you currently connect to an open access point without any encryption. If you are connecting to an open access point that supports WPA3, there will be encryption established on the fly without any user interaction. That of course tends to be not as secure and we'll have to see how they exactly implemented it. I haven't really looked at the specs yet. Typically there are some man in the middle vulnerabilities or so in these schemes, but either way it's probably better than what people are doing now. The typical attack surface with these opportunistic encryption schemes is during the initial handshake phase. But once you have the encrypted channel set up, then you're pretty good. So in short, probably better what we got now and I still have to look at the details to really figure out how this all works. And Matt Nelson from Spectre Ops came across an interesting new method to trick users into executing arbitrary code. On a modern Windows 10 system, that has become actually kind of difficult if some basic security rules are in place. It's no longer easy to sort of include executable code in Office documents. And uh, well, Office itself actually can be configured and should be configured to not allow it to spawn any processes period. So what Matt came across was the dot setting content MS files. This file format was intended to be used as a shortcut file for various settings within Windows 10 to make it easier for the user to end up in the right settings category. Now the file itself is an XML file and yes, there is an option where with an XML directive, you can just start an arbitrary binary on the system and pass arguments to it. These files will bypass all the common restrictions. They can be downloaded from the internet and they will execute code just as the user clicks open. They can also be embedded in Office documents. So pretty neat bypass here. Microsoft was notified of this issue and decided not to fix it for now. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation took a closer look at Start 
TLS. Now, start TLS for email is one of those neat little protocols that really can make the internet a lot more secure. With email, when mail servers connect to each other, they don't really know ahead of time if the receiving mail server will actually support TLS. So Start TLS allows them to negotiate that on the fly. But there are some problems with that. Since the connection starts unencrypted, unauthenticated, a man in the middle can essentially remove these Start TLS messages and then you never know that the other site does support star TLS and the email will not be encrypted. In addition, the Electronic Frontier Foundation found that most servers that do support star TLS do so using self-signed or invalid certificates. Now, to help with these two problems, the Electronic Frontier Foundation started its star TLS Everywhere project. What this entails is first of all an extension of CertBot. That's the Let's Encrypt script that allows you to actually set up TLS certificates and such for free and automatically. Well, it extended this script to Postfix, probably the most popular mail server out there. Secondly, they started compiling a list of mail servers that do support start TLS. The idea here is that this list could be preloaded into a mail server similar to the HTTP strict transport security and indicate to mail servers that mail servers on this list will only speak start TLS. So if a man in the middle is removing these headers, well, uh, then you know and you can refuse to send the email. Interesting approach. I'm not sure if this list will scale. We'll see how this works. Their site seems to have some issues with the load currently, but take a look at it and uh, see if you want to add your domain to this list. Well, this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.